We can have this idea that real life comes from freedom. That real life comes from me being able to do whatever I want. There's a strong modern narrative that real life and joy, real happiness and satisfaction is found in you being you. That life is found and experienced by you being whatever you want to be and doing whatever you want to do. That real life comes from making yourself into your own image. And it is true that each of us is free to grow into whatever we want to be. We have that freedom to create ourselves in whatever image we would like. But the question is, is that image bringing you real, lasting life? Because while all kinds of life can grow and exist in this world, not all of them will last. Not all of them will last. Last week we used this imagery of Jesus as a gardener. He's setting up his garden, putting everything in order. Before a gardener uh, plants his garden with life, he still has to till the earth, set out the flower beds, remove all the rocks, feed the soil, but in all that work before anything's ever planted. If a gardener has gone to all that work to set his garden in order, is he going to be haphazard about the life that he lets grow in it? Is he going to just let anything grow in his garden? No. There is the fruitful life that he nurtures and the choking weeds that he removes. We're taking away the plants that take life away from the garden. And this is what we see with God. Once he set everything in order, he fills it with his life, his life. And he invites us to participate in the gardening. And in so doing, to be filled with his life by being made into his image. Let's take a look together. Day 4, verse 14. And God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. So straight away we see, as we pointed out it would be the case last week, we can see that day 1 and day 4 are parallel. On day one, God separates the light from the darkness. On day four, he creates the sun and the moon and the stars to govern that separation. God makes the order and then he fills the order with life. Now, we are perhaps not used to thinking of the sun and moon and stars as life, as being alive. We think of the sun and stars as kind of big balls of incandescent gas, don't we? And the moon and the rock and the moon and the planets are just kind of like rocks hurtling through space. And so we might mistaken this work as being the same kind of work as the first three days. The same as kind of manoeuvring the land or the sea. Um, but to ancient people, the stars, the heavenly lights, they were divine beings. And so the Bible uses that language throughout it, doesn't it? When we hear about Satan falling in Revelation 9, he's described as a star falling from heaven. Later, when the other angels are described as falling, again, it's a, a third of the stars are swept down from the heavens. Genesis is speaking about more than just the creation of plasma and rock. These are the heavenly creatures that he's creating. And they are for signs and for marking seasons. Now, we could argue that plasma and rock can also be for signs and marking seasons, as they take up different positions in the sky, telling us the times and the seasons. But what plasma and rock can't do is rule. They can't rule. Did you catch that in verse 18? They were created to rule over the night and the day and separate the light and the darkness. 
But we might go, hang on a minute, hasn't Jesus already separated the light from the darkness? Yes, he has. And what we see here is this overlapping of reality. The way he does that is by setting these angels to separate it, to continue the work that God began on day one, to participate in that, in that rule in the heavenly spaces. So God creates the heavenly spaces and then he fills them with life, with angelic beings who will rule with him as part of his divine council, keeping order in the spiritual world. Day 5, verse 20. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kinds. Again, um, day 5 here parallels day 2, doesn't it? On day two, God separated the waters above from the waters below, creating the seas and the sky. He makes the space, and then day five, he fills it. He fills the sea, and he fills the sky. And it's interesting, an interesting thing to note is that in the Hebrew, where it says in our translation, every living thing, the Hebrew word is literally soul. Soul. And this, all, this is important for our understanding of life, and it'll become more important later on when we think about what death is as death arrives. Because we often, we often think about that only humans have souls, don't we? But in the ancient and in biblical thoughts, having a soul, it was not an object that you obtained. It's simply what made something alive, rather than inanimate. So a rock is inanimate. It is without a soul. But a fish, that's an ensouled creature. A dog is an ensouled creature. It's alive, it's living. And so verse 20 literally says, And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of souls. Swarms of living things. Let the waters be filled with creatures that are alive. Just before you wonder, um, what that doesn't mean, however, is that they have the same kind of life as humans. And we'll get to what that difference is in just a minute. But just hold in your mind that when we, come for when we come to understand what death is, your soul is not like an object. It is simply the life of your body. Day 6, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So on the third day, do you remember God um, pulls back the sea to make the dry land appear? He makes the order. And then now on day six, he fills that land, he fills that order with souls. And so now we have the sea is full of souls, the sky is full of souls, and the earth is full of souls. All the chaos has been put in order, and now all the void is filled with life. What could God possibly do to top all of this? Well, of course, next he creates humans. But as I said earlier on, we're just going to divert from that for a moment, if you'll permit me, to look at day seven. I really want to put day seven in. I want to look, not put, put it in. I want to look at it today. Um, it's not really enough there for a whole week. So I want to look at it today, but I do want to finish with thinking about humans. And that's what I want to end on, with our mind on that. So we're going to jump to day seven, and then we're going to come back to look at humans again. So day seven, chapter two, verse one. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So we have this word rest, God rested. And the way that we often use the word rest in English, it kind of... It brings to mind sitting down, having a drink, cooling off, getting your energy back, ready to go again. Obviously, that doesn't apply to God, does it? God never sleeps. God never needs to get his energy back. So what does it mean that he rested? Well, there is another way we use the word rest in English that will help us to understand. Imagine you witness a, a rock rolling down a hill. And you're describing it to somebody. 
And you might say, and then it came to rest at the bottom of the ravine. What do you mean by that? What you mean is, and then it came to the place that it now sits. That's where it is. It came to the place it now sits. And that is simply what's being described here. God came to rest very simply means he sat down. The image here is of God sitting down, not to take a break, not to take a load off, but sitting down enthroned over his creation that he's now made. So God's rest is really another way of talking about God's kingdom. Everything's in order, there's justice and peace, and God sits on his throne to preside over his creation. Thinking back to last week, as we were thinking of what creation tells us about the, the days of, of Christ's passion, the third day, what happens eventually? He ascends to the throne and he's seated. And so when God comes to give the command about keeping the Sabbath, this is what he uses to explain it. The rest of the week, um, sorry, at, at the rest at the end of the week wasn't primarily about stopping physical exertion. It was about entering God's rest. It was about entering his kingdom, his rule. And so in doing that, obviously, you didn't busy yourself with the work of the world. You took the day to actively enjoy God's kingdom in worship. And so just, just a word on this whilst we're here. Today is not the Sabbath. Yesterday was the Sabbath. I mention this because sometimes Christians... Or you'll have, you'll find Christians saying that Sunday is the new Sabbath. It isn't. Sunday is the first day of the week. It's always the first day of the week. The Sabbath is always the last day of the week. Sunday is not the Sabbath. It's the Lord's Day. It's something different. And I dare say something better. Now what this means is we don't just lazily take Sabbath instructions and apply them, apply them to Sunday. There are some things we'd want to apply and think about how we do the Lord's Day, but we can't just go do a one-for-one one thing because the focus of Sabbath and the Lord's Day are different. The Sabbath was about resting in God's kingdom and looking forward to the fulfillment of God's kingdom, specifically looking forward to Jesus coming and fulfilling the kingdom, fulfilling the law. And so Jesus comes, doesn't he? And he fulfills the Sabbath. And what does he say? On the sixth day of the week, on Good Friday, he says, it is finished. Jesus finished his work, and then what does he do? He rests in the tomb. His body rests in the tomb on the Sabbath, on Saturday. And then, on the eighth day, um, the first day of a new week, Jesus rises again. The work is done, Jesus' kingdom has come upon the earth in the New Testament church, and so for Christians, our focus is no longer looking forward to Christ's kingdom coming upon the earth, it already has, it's here, this is it, we're experiencing it now. Instead, we are looking forward to kind of the next great, uh, greatest thing, the day of resurrection. And so our day of worship shifts from Saturday, a rest day, to Sunday, resurrection day. The day, the Lord's day, the day of new creation, the day of resurrection, because that's what our focus is looking forward to. Now, back to day six then, verse 26 of chapter one. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. On day six, as the pinnacle of creation, God makes man, male and female, man. And what makes us the pinnacle of creation is that man is made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? There are lots of ideas about what the image of God is and what it means to be made in that image. We know it doesn't mean we physically look like God. We know it's not like we're a photo of God. But people often do think of it as a static category, that it can be boiled down to a single characteristic. And people will try and take an attribute of humanity and say, you know, whatever it is, because humans have 
this and other creatures don't have it, this must be what it means to be in the image of God. But that's the wrong approach. And we end up with a load of serious problems if we try and do it that way. A classic example that used to be used, thankfully is less used now, some people will say, is language. So some people will say the ability to use language is what makes us the image of God. And it's an interesting idea, isn't it? Because Jesus is the word. I like it. But, but now we've discovered that actually lots of animals use language and can even have complex family groups and relationships. So that idea doesn't work even on the most basic level. It doesn't differentiate us from all the animals. But more importantly, if we make the ability to communicate the evidence of the image of God, what does that mean for people with learning disabilities? What does it mean for the nonverbal? Does it mean that they are less than the image of God? Do you see the problem? And this isn't just a problem that's, uh, you know, a logical problem. This is a problem that's played itself out in history in real ways. Another common claim is that reason, having the ability to be rational, to reason, is what makes, means that we are made in the image of God. But again, this causes big problems, doesn't it? Because what does that mean for the unborn infants? Are they not in the image of God because they can't exercise reason? What about someone with advanced dementia or suffering from a brain injury? Are they less than human? Really, any attempt to nail down the image of God as being connected to some human faculty not only never works out, but often leads us to morally and ethically dangerous places. Being the image of God is not about a single static characteristic that we have. It's more to do with the capacity that we all share. The potential that every human being has, regardless of age, of mental capacity, of physical ability, or even whether you're born or unborn. Being made in the image of God means we have the potential to be like God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that we can be like God? Well, let me explain. The most common biblical metaphor for someone being in somebody else's image is the metaphor, the picture of a father and a son. It's even the language that the Bible uses to describe God the Father and God the Son, doesn't it? Jesus being the image of the Father. And what does it mean for Jesus to be the image of his Father? Well, it's that he, he, the things that he says are the things that the Father says. The things that he, he does are the things that his Father does. He is being the image of the Father. And this is a big theme in John's Gospel. John 5, 19 for whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise, Jesus says. Or John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and being his image on earth. Uh, Jesus does whatever his Father does. And so in John 14, verse 9, he can say, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the image of the Father because he's doing and being what his Father is doing and being. Imaging someone means doing the same things they do. So when somebody says to me, you're the spitting image of your Father, sometimes they might mean there's something physical about my appearance, but more often it's an expression or a mannerism that reminds them of my dad. I'm acting in a way where I'm being like my father and there's a distinction then between likeness and image God says let us make man in our image after our likeness now grammatically those two words are synonyms grammatically they're, they're the same sort of word but it's put in there twice and used a slightly different way and the church fathers make a theological distinction between these two uses of these two words image is the potential we all have to be images, imitators and participants in the life of God. Likeness is achieving it. Likeness is achieving it. So all humans are born with the same opportunity and potential to be God's image, to reflect him in the world. 
But not all of us will. Not all of us will achieve his likeness. Being made in the image of God speaks of the potential we all have to share in the life of Jesus. To be participants in his life. To be changed. To become like him. Functioning as God's image is a reality that's open to all of us. And it's something we can choose to do or choose not to do. Sharing the life of Jesus is open to every single one of us. And so what does God tell us to do as his image bearers? How do we do what he does and be what he is? Verse 28, And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Now notice the two things that we're, to do, we're called to do as image bearers of God. Fill and subdue. Do those two things remind you of anything? These are the two things that God's been doing. Putting the earth in order, subduing it, and filling it with life. The chief way we have been given to do this is through the creation of families and having children. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. What God could do alone, we need to do together. God created families to have a father and a mother. There's a couple of important, important things that I think need to be addressed here. This is where they, this is where they come up in scripture. Uh, this is not something you'll hear every week because it doesn't come up every week. It comes up here. I'm going to say a couple of things. Uh, up front, I'm going to say that to many people are controversial and are potentially very emotive. The first is that the way God has made us to image him is that he's made us male and female. But there seems to be a lot of confusion today about what a man is and what a woman is. But it really is very simple. And it's found in this description of what it means to, be multi uh, to multiply the image of God. To be, multi to be multipliers of the image of God. Which can only happen between a man and a woman. Y you need one of each. And so what this means is that a man is a human who has the potential to image God by begetting life. And a woman is a human who has the potential to image God by bearing life. Or another way, a man is a human who has the potential to impregnate. And a woman is a human who has the potential to become pregnant. You are one or the other. Now an objection to this definition of man and woman is to say, so are you saying, if I don't have kids, I'm not a real woman? No. No. That's actually not what was just said. But I understand in this world, that's, that's how we sometimes hear those things. That's not what was just said. And so I just want, to, I want us to hear this very carefully. What makes you a woman is not the ability to bear children, but the potential. The potential. And the same goes for men and begetting as well. So if you never marry and never have children, you are no less a woman. You have the potential, but not the ability. And this is perhaps even more important to hear if you're infertile. If what makes a human a woman is the potential to bear children, and if you're infertile, you might say, so you're saying I'm not a woman because that potential isn't in me. But the thing is, this is the thing, the potential is in you. Which is what makes it so painful when it doesn't happen. You know that potential is in you, but it's not coming to its fullness. And it's heartbreaking. There is something wrong. Because creation is broken. Our bodies are broken. There is something stopping that potential from being fulfilled. But it is there. And you are no less a woman or a man because you do not have the ability to beget or to bear. Together, Male and female participate in the likeness of God by multiplying children in families. And it may be that you cannot beget or bear children, but it does not mean that you have no part in multiplying images within church life. Within this family of the church, 
Everyone has a role in nurturing our children and bringing them into the full likeness of Christ. Whether you yourself have begotten them or born them yourself, you are part of this family and your role is to see that come to fullness. The second issue we need to talk about here is it's really important and it doesn't come up naturally or easily in just normal everyday pastoral conversations. It's a bit heavy, but it is information that is not readily available elsewhere because it's not something the world particularly cares about. God has told us that the way we participate in his life is to have children. And so this is why generally... Christians have not accepted contraceptive methods as a valid practice, as it flies in the face of God's express command. Because remember, if this is just a simple piece of history, if this is just, it's meant to just tell us about a seven day week that happened long, long ago, then we could reason, well, God's command for that was actually only to these two people, for them to multiply, not, not to me. But if this is a paradigmatic story, a story that's telling us how to understand what it is to be human, then it is for all of us. Just as we, are, we innately realise that it's not just Adam and Eve who are made in the image of God, but all of us. In the same way, this is an instruction command for all of us. The church has always resisted the rise of contraceptive practices. And while there may be room for discussion where it comes to barrier methods, what is clear is that we don't use contraceptive medicines. I just want to mention at this point that I understand what I'm about to say could be upsetting, especially if we've used them. But it would be really unloving for me not to say anything at all. Something doctors don't tell women is that while barrier methods stop life from arising in the first place, a pill ends it. I'm not just talking about the morning after one, I'm talking about any hormonal birth control. Hormonal birth control, whether it be a pill or an implant, does not guarantee that a seed and an egg never meet. But it does guarantee that it won't survive. And so any method that does not stop seed and egg from meeting, but still guarantees no pregnancy, is potentially abortive. And I understand that that is shocking, especially if we've used them. We must know that these methods are not an option for us as Christians. And if you need to talk to me about this, please do. Or if you'd like to talk to me and Rachel about this, please do. It's an important and sensitive issue that can't be dealt in its fullness from the pulpit, but this is the place it's most easily raised so that you can come and talk to me about it. We hear the phrase, don't we, life begins at conception, and, and obviously that is true on a biological level. But truly, life begins with Jesus and the command he's given that we fill the earth. And so let's have a bigger vision for life than just that biological cellular level. Life does not begin just when a seed and an egg meet. It begins when a man and a woman meet. Every time that happens, there should be the potential for life to come forth. That act is not to be divorced from childbearing. If we take that gift of life and use it in a way that makes the potential for children impossible, then we are abusing the gift and command to fill the earth with image bearers. I don't think it's, if you just, you know, if we just look... The rise of contraception has been lockstep with the rise of immorality. It has made children a problem to solve rather than a gift to receive. And the ability to essentially neuter ourselves and divorce ourselves from our reproductive potential has led to immense gender confusion. Because who I am is no longer linked to what I beget or what I bear. And the rise of contraception has enabled the cult of the individual because it gives you complete, customizable power over your life. We now have the ability to make our life completely about ourselves, about our comforts, and whether or not we want the accessory of children 
And if we do, how many fits our lifestyle? Now we don't need to worry about it. We can create ourselves in whatever image we desire, keeping all of our time and resources for ourselves so that we can grow into whatever image we want to be. Let me draw this to a conclusion as I say that every human is created with the potential to grow into something, to be made into the image of something. And the choices are God or not God. We can grow into the likeness of Jesus or we can grow into the likeness of some other image, self, Satan, of the world. All those things, all those three things are basically the same thing because they're not Jesus. And this is important. This is important because at the end of it all, there is going to be a new creation. And in that new creation, there will be no weeds. When I say weeds, I don't mean people. I mean the things in us. Those are the weeds that need to be pulled out. There'll be no weeds. There'll be no death. There'll be no selfishness or pride or greed. There will not be individuals. There will just be the life of Jesus shared and reflected in everything. That is not the way the world is right now. In a couple of weeks, we're going to see why that is. But it's not like that just now. And so we are awaiting the great day of justice when the gardener will come and remove all the weeds, all the stuff that's not meant to be in his garden, including all the stuff in us that can't live in his new creation. There is a reason why the Bible so often uses agricultural imagery to speak of that final day of harvesting and winnowing, of weeding and pruning. On that great day, Jesus is going to remove all the life that does not bear his likeness. And so what does that mean for us now? Well, first of all, it means Jesus is being patient with us. He hasn't come back yet. He's gracious to us and patient with us. And it means that we as Christians are eighth-day people. We are looking forward to that day, not because it's going to be super fun, but because it's going to be super good. It's going to be good to be put in order. We're looking forward to it, meaning that we're getting ready for it. We want as much of our life as possible to be reflecting the likeness of Jesus and to enter into that eighth day. But this is the thing, and we may be experiencing that this morning. It doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen without pain and turmoil as we face those parts of our life that we hate, that we're ashamed of, that are so clearly broken. It's not easy. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifetime of following Jesus and tackling the weeds of our hearts together, gently, graciously, helping each other. It can be painful and heartbreaking to face the reality of our sin and our mistakes. But we want them removed from us now, don't we? We don't want to wait to the end and hope there's still some image of Christ worth salvaging. We want all the potential within us to bear fruit now, in our lives, in the lives of our family and children. And so we place ourselves under the brooding spirit of Christ. We place ourselves in the church, the place where Jesus is at work today, actively pruning and saving, bringing out the likeness of Jesus. If we do not allow ourselves to be pruned and weeded today, in this life, as painful as it is, we will be pruned at the end when it will be far more painful and far more lasting. This is why we pursue repentance. We fast to prune our out-of-control passions we confess so that Jesus can deal with our sin. We pray so that we're drawn into the life of Jesus. It's why we discipline our children. It's why we set boundaries for them and do the hard and often painful work of pruning them because we want them to survive the final harvest. It's why we pursue, why we pursue order in divine worship because this is the place we are put in order and filled with life. The only life that will last through the end is the life of Jesus. And so we want that life to be nurtured in us today. All glory be to Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen.